G'day and welcome to the Mind Your Body Show. I am your host, Jacob Andre, and today I'm talking to Mark Ladbrook. So if you'd like to know more about high performance coaching in the 400 meter sprints at the Tokyo 2021 Olympics, stay tuned. G'day and welcome to the episode prelude for Mark Ladbrook. Now, before we get into it, please make sure you have subscribed on your favorite podcasting platform, whether that is Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and that you're subscribed on our website, www.themindyourbodyshow.com. And there you can get access to all of our episodes, past, present, and future. Now, of course, I absolutely love sharing stuff out on social media and Facebook and Instagram is the place where I like to spend most of my time at the Mind Your Body Show. So please head on over there and give us a follow or a like. All right, let's get into this prelude with Mark. Now, Mark is actually a accomplished 400 meter sprinter himself. He went to the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. He says he pushed on to the year 2000 to go to Sydney. And then from there, he got into coaching. I actually came across him many, many years ago as an athlete myself. I was never that good, but a mate of mine was. His name is Josh Brogan, and it was him who suggested to me that I reach out to Mark and try to get him on the podcast. So Josh was actually a really good 400-meter runner. We had a coach. Her name was Cherry Harvey, and she had done a coaching course with Mark, and then from there asked asked him to come up to Darwin, where we lived, and do a coaching course up here and do some training. From there, she asked Mark to take Josh under his wing and take him down to Melbourne, give him a place to stay. Josh actually stayed with Mark and his family and trained with him and his group down in Melbourne. And this group was a really good training group at the time. And that group has only gotten better. Mark is now the coach of Australia's 400 meter Olympian at the recent Tokyo 2021 Olympics, Alex Beck. And it was really interesting hearing Mark talk about the high performance coaching process going into the Tokyo Olympics. Now, the thing that stands out to me the most was when Mark talks about one of the reps they were doing, it was a 200 meter uh, rep and Alex ran too fast by half a second. And as a result of that, nearly cost himself a place at going to the Olympics. So it's funny that he could have been going too fast. And as a result of that, they had to modify his training leading to the Olympics. Now, Alex went on to very, only minimally miss out on a semi-final by I think it was three hundredths of a second and that story is probably the most memorable story of the entire episode but it was absolutely great to hear Mark talk about how he got into athletics his experience as an athlete and in particular what he believes to be the difference between all of the athletes at the Olympics so how you go from making a team through to actually winning medals at the Olympics and that range of athletes and the difference and there being very, very minimal difference. But what that difference is um, across the broad spectrum of athletes who are Olympians. So without any further ado, let's get into this episode with Mark Ladbrook. Mark, thank you for joining us on the Mind Your Body Show. Good morning, Jacob. Thanks for having me. So the first thing I'd like to ask is how do you mind your body? What do you do to look after yourself? Uh, well, I'm certainly getting a little bit older now, and um, I have been very uh, big on my whole life. I guess you know, my, my little business is called Athletic for Life, and I try and keep every part of athleticism that I can latch onto from my youth um, as much as possible. So I still try and do a little bit of running, a little bit of circuits, gym, strength training, um, go to the beach, what, whatever, act, any activities that I can um, do on a daily basis to keep me active, running around and coaching and chasing kids around and uh, all of it contributes to that. And, and I think essentially making sure that I eat, you know, eat well and don't overindulge in alcohol or food too much, but if, of course we have a little bit. So that's, I guess, yeah, that holistic lifestyle approach rather than trying to do anything too specific. And that certainly helps keep me on track for sure. So are you still competing in athletics right now? Are you still competitive? Uh, I never officially retired, but I tend to every maybe four or five years, just pick a little master's competition that I can stretch the legs out um, and just see how I go. Because I, I, I really do miss the competitive side of um, sport. And that tends to motivate me to train a little bit um, of a higher level. 
Uh, been a little bit sidetracked over the last few years with the coaching going up a notch, but um, yeah, I'm looking next year. I turn 50, and that's a new window in the masters category. So I've got a couple of little goals that I'd kind of secretly, um, you know, would like to achieve there. So that 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 might be yeah. Watch this space for the competition next year. But uh, if I can do that, then I'll probably put that to bed for another couple of years. But um, yeah, so yeah, occasionally I do just for fun. So I think is the next Masters Games in Perth. Is that correct? Twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two? Uh, that's a good question, actually. There's a, there's always a, there's so many different things on. I think there's a World Masters on. I've got a feeling it might be somewhere in Europe next year. And um, there's always a local Pan Pacific Masters Games here on the Gold Coast every couple of years. Uh, so that's there's one actually later in the year which doesn't help me with my age category too well because uh, I'll still be forty nine. But um, yeah, there's definitely a few comps on next year, even if it's at that kind of state or national level that I'd I'd have a look at. Um, but yeah, who knows about the international ones? I'll I'll probably keep that for my um, elite athletes at <laughs> the international <laughs> level. Yeah. See how so you, you mentioned the Gold Coast and I know you've previously lived in Melbourne. I'm going to get to that and that move yep. and why you're on the Gold Coast now. Um, but let's go right back to early childhood, Mark. And did you participate in athletics? What was life like? That What led you to where you are and made you the person you are today? Uh, yeah, for me, it was literally, you know, I, where I grew up in Melbourne was in, down in Bayside and um, my family lived about 400 metres from the Little Athletics, Sandringham Little Athletics Club. And my older brother already participated in Little Athletics. I harassed my father, who was the president of the club, to just join earlier than what I was allowed to. So I started at four years of age, just competing against the six-year-old kids. And, um, at, and I literally haven't really stopped. So. It's kind of been 45 years of athletics straight. So, um, <laughs> but I've, you know, I've done a lot of things along the way, but I've really enjoyed it. So it's a great international global sport and yeah, that's where it all started for me. So, yeah. so you're a sprint coach. Were you a sprinter as a young person? Yeah. So I, as a little kid, I did, you know, like all the other kids would do all the events and I gravitated, you know, I could run fairly fast for my age. So that, pushed me in that direction, did a little bit of jumping and um, had zero clue about hurdling. So I didn't really like that too much. Anything past 200 metres, I was very disinterested in. Um, my old dad used to try and make me do some cross-country things and stuff along the way, and I just didn't want a bar of it. So, um, yeah, I was definitely a fast twitch kid. And, um, yeah, but, I mean, I was always try everything I'd get in there. And do it, and then so that was our summer sport, and then our winter sport we'd play AFL or you know football back back in those days. That was the that was the other side of the road where the uh, football ground was. So it was very much athletics and AFL, and I grew up yeah pretty much playing those two sports. So the real important question here is, what AFL team do you support? Uh, yes, yeah, poor old St Kilda. So you know they they're going okay, but yeah, we just love love them for step it up one year i've had a couple of close calls in the last few decades but yeah they you know they, they're my team so that's yeah right along with them yeah so what uh so you've spent a bit of i know you've come to darwin a few times tell me a little bit about your you know um trips to my hometown of darwin yeah well uh so cherry harvey who we talked about previously she's uh i've I met her doing a level well level four coaching qualification 20 odd years ago um, and we had a very similar philosophy about athletics and coaching and that kind of thing and um, yeah and then she contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in coming to do some coaching up there and uh, first time I'd never been there before in my life so I, I must have been it would have been early 2000s back then um, and just came up and did some coaching clinics and uh, the, the weather in the middle of um, our winter in Melbourne was so fantastic. I was very relieved to escape. So for a few years in a row, I used to really look forward to that trip. I'd come up to Darwin and, and do the training up there and the main fantastic facilities and the climate and weather and the markets and all the food and everything. I used to, yeah, it was sometimes I had moments about, you know, moving there permanently. I really loved it. So yeah, due for a visit. But, yeah. That'd be great if you did. Um, so with the Olympics recently on, what, why do you think the Australian 
athletics team didn't come and train in Darwin with the weather conditions being so similar to Tokyo, whereas the yeah. swim, much of the swim team did? Yeah, uh, look, that's a good question. I mean, I, we had our camp up in Cairns, so I think Athletics Australia probably just looked at it purely as, oh, well, that might be a little bit closer and easier and it's East Coast and I don't even understand, you know, I don't really know their decision about why they didn't choose Darwin over Cairns. But, um, yeah, I mean, Cairns was, was a, you know, good place. I'd never been there before either. So that was, that was good to go. Um, but, yeah, I, I would have been really supportive with Darwin. And may, maybe it was just the travel of the up and down kind of thing. But, um, yeah, not sure. But, yeah, from a facilities and, yeah, climate point of view, it would have been very good. Yeah, Cairns is also a very nice yeah. place and probably a couple of yeah. degrees cooler, which is probably, you know, other than Darwin. I think Darwin Yeah, tends but to... I think this time of year, yeah, like you say, you know, we want to get as close to the Tokyo weather as possible. And as, you know, as we've seen in the past couple of weeks, it's been very hot and humid over there. So, um, yeah, the closer we could have got to that, probably the better. Yeah. So how was the transition um, into coaching? What led you to that? Uh, so I was, as an athlete, you know, I, I spent many years working through, you know, juniors into seniors and um, I, you know, competed, I competed at the Atlanta Olympics in 400 metres. So that was kind of a lifelong goal achieved. And, and then I, I pushed on for a few more years where maybe I shouldn't have um, towards the Sydney Olympics because it was a home Olympics. Um, I had a, you know, a lot of, I had a lot of big problems with some Achilles injuries and surgery and a few things like that. And, um, in those years of transitioning from being an athlete out of being an athlete to what the hell am I going to do with my life kind of moments. Um, I was finishing up my, I actually did a sports coaching degree and um, I was working a little bit in some AFL and uh, rugby clubs and a couple of different things there, but I was still not really sure what I wanted to do. Um, had a few athletes kind of asking me questions and I could see that they weren't really heading down the right pathway with their training or, you know, they were a little bit lost with what to do. So next thing I knew, I was just helping athletes and giving them some advice. And before I knew it, I had a squad and then it just that kind of exploded into, yeah, I mean, I, funnily enough, I'd actually spent a couple of years previous um, at the end of my athletics career studying architecture because that was what I'd always wanted to do. Um, and then I just, it was like a huge big sidestep. I had no intention of ever becoming a coach or working in sport. I was happy to see the end of it, but, um, yeah, I've never really left it as it turned out. So I've been helping athletes and working different professional teams for yeah, the last 20 odd years now. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just become part of life. Yeah. So tell me about the Atlanta Olympics. Uh, it was pretty hot and humid too, similar to Darwin. Um, it was, I mean, it's a bit of a blur now. It's like, I, was, I just realised the other day, it's 25 years ago. So it's been, it's been a long time ago. It's like another lifetime. A different person was there for that one. I, I think in my athletics career and the le years leading up to the, um, those Olympics, I, I didn't notice at the time, but, I, you know, this is, you think about it for us, it was pre internet access and um, very limited opportunities to talk to international coaches and athletes unless they were right in front of your face. And um, the, I mean, I'd been to the world championships previously and a couple of world university games as well. And I always found myself being that athlete who would be hanging out at the warm up track, asking and talking to coaches and athletes and just kind of hanging around and watching and observing a lot of things and, um, you know, where a lot of athletes would be off at the shopping malls doing that kind of thing. And I just wanted to find out more and more information about what made these people so successful and what were they doing in their training programs and just their life. And just, I was very inquisitive about my sport. And um, of course, in hindsight now, I realise I was probably never going to be the greatest athlete, but it certainly has made me a much better coach. So... Um, yeah, all of those years of pestering different athletes and coaches has really helped me as a coach now. So, yeah. Interesting you so say that. So getting back to the Olympics, yeah. I mean, it was a fantastic experience, but it was, um, 
yeah, probably more of a really big learning experience for me. I was yeah ripped out of uh, you know little well Melbourne, and I in in the end I end up moving. My parents moved to a farm in Gippsland, and I'd spent my secondary school out there, living on a farm and very isolated out there. And information and knowledge was hard to come by. So when I could get to travel and be at these competitions, it was fantastic. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna come back to that point that I was about to get to, but I want to oh, ask yeah. about Atlanta. <laughs> what was the most memorable moment? What was the one thing that stands out to you about the you know being an athlete at the Atlanta Olympics? Um, I think I think the biggest thing is the realization when you're you know an athlete from the other side of the world and you're going there to compete is that all of the athletes there they're all just human and they're all got They've all got two arms and two legs and they're the ones who really want to be there and be successful are there because they really want to be like they they've created that environment and their lifestyle and their situation. And for me, that was probably the biggest part of that learning experience is seeing, you know, like a Michael Johnson who's winning the double gold in the 200 and 400 breaking world records and just watching the process that he's going through and, and, you know, seeing those kind of scenarios and, you know, you're watching, you know, Carl Lewis, who's on his fourth Olympics winning a fourth gold in the long jump. And, you know, there I am stretching on the steeplechase with him in the warm up, And he'd been my idol since I was a little kid, you know, and I had cutouts of the newspapers stuck on my bedroom wall. And then there I was kind of stretching on the steeplechase with him at the warm up track and, you know, we're having a conversation. So, yeah, they're, they're pretty good moments where you can look back on and think, oh, yeah, you know, I got to that kind of level and it was worth the effort. So, um, you know, of course, our performance-wise, we always want to do a lot better. In hindsight, there's so many things I wish I had a little time machine. I could go back and have a chat to myself and be like, don't do this, do this. Um, but, you know, that's my opportunity to do that now as a coach. I can prevent a lot of, um, hopefully, poor decision-making from some of these athletes. Yeah. Interesting you say that, and that's a perfect segue into that point. And it is about being the greatest. You made a comment about, I uh, realized I wasn't ever going to be the greatest. However, for most people, the fact that you went to the Olympics is a phenomenal achievement. And I'm yeah. glad that you kind of then said, you know, like how great it was. Um, yeah. I saw yeah. recently shared by our first ever guest on the Mind Your Body show, Loris Bertolacci, who's a strength and conditioning yeah. coach. Yeah, and, I know Loris, yeah. Yeah, and he, yeah. he was an athlete who was saying, you know, we get disappointed when we finish and, and we get the silver because we didn't win the gold or we win the gold and we're disappointed because we didn't just yes, break that world record. Never enough, it's, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so what is that mindset? Because that sounds exactly yep. what you had in your mind yep. about. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, and I mean, and even now, like I've got friends, you know, who are, I've traveled with and made teams with and we, you know, here we are 25 years later and we'll catch up for a beer and talk about oh, back in the day and, you know, and we do, and we say, oh, geez, you know, if we only we had have known, we could have done this, and the moon's aligned, and we might have been able to win a bronze medal in this at this particular moment if we had have done all of these things. And, and I mean, it's, you know, it's fun to kind of do it, but the reality is, you know, that's, that's what happened. Um, but I think, you know, when you're young and you're youthful, you know, you're always aiming to be the best. Like, you want to see, you want to challenge yourself. And that's why I love track and field, because it's, it's very, it's a very measured sport. You find out exactly where you're at. And, you know, and I always say to the young kids that's in the school programs or whatever, I talk, you know, I say, well, think about athletics. It's, it's the one sport where every single person on the planet has at one time in their life tried to run as fast as they possibly can. They might've done it when they were five years old. They might've done it when they're older, but everybody's judged themselves running against some other kid in their class or as a little kid or whatever. So we do find out who the absolute best, fastest runners are. And then it moves up from there and they all branch off and play their other sports. But so to me, that sport of track and field is, you know, that's kind of the pinnacle sport for a reason. So um, you do really find out who the best, best is. So, you know, you go there and you finish top 25 or 30 in the world and, you know, you do, you're disappointed. But then the reality of it in hindsight, you look back and go, well, there's 7 billion people in the world. It's not too bad. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's easy to be hard, hard on yourself. And, you know, and there's a lot of other factors, you know, which 
we do find out about in history with, you know, there's drugs in sport and there's a lot of, you know, there's full-time professional athletes versus most Australians do it as a hobby and have to work and study and do everything part-time. So the challenges of all of that are rolled into, you know, and you just do the best you can with what you have. And that's pretty much all we can do. So while you're in it, it's very much about challenging yourself and it's never enough. But at what point, because of, it sounds to me like it is enough now that you yeah. are really grateful for your experiences and opportunities. So at what point does that start to transition and become enough? I, I reckon it took me a good decade after the fact because, you, you know, you're... You finish those things and then you, once you start, you know, my, for me, it was getting injured. I had injuries that prevented me from going to a second or a third Olympics and um, that's really frustrating. I had a lot of years of just pushing through, trying to get back to that kind of level and you do, you find out a lot about yourself and your determination and your willpower and your reasoning as to why you do, why the hell am I doing this? Sometimes you wake up and yeah, eventually you get to a point and you go, well, I'm not doing it anymore. And then I had a couple of years of literally, I didn't want a bar of the sport at all. And that's when I was working in rugby and AFL and other sports where I could make a living out of it. Um, and then I actually just started missing just running. I just missed being able to just go out and enjoy running. And that was the moment when we talk about that for me was I started just doing some running again and my, you know, my Achilles injury had healed and I was at learned how to manage things and I'd understood things a lot better. And um, I just found myself out training for the fun of it. And, you know, one of my friends who was a Sydney Olympian who I had a lot to do with his coaching him, um, he and I in Melbourne, we used, to, we used to go and meet once a week on a freezing cold winter's Melbourne night down at Olympic Park and we'd, go and belt out six 300s for the lactic just to do it for fun because we missed it. And, we, you know, then we're going to have a pizza and a beer after the session. We'd be lying on the ground dead and it was the best fun we'd have all week. So, you know, it's, it's funny what you get used to, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. So, so are you still, by the way, are you still doing that? Do you still just for fun now just go and bang out like some lac lactic acid? I try, type yeah, sessions? I mean, I, I get stuck into my guys because I'll, I, where I'm, so now, fast forward, I've moved up to the Gold Coast for the past uh, 11, 12 years. Uh, live on four acres up on a hill in the kind of edge of the hinterland. And I've got um, a really good gym facility set up and plenty of outdoor space. And, um, you know, I love to just go down to the gym and just open, open it all up. And I just train, push myself really hard for the fun of it. I like to just do that because... You know, and, and I'm lucky that as I've gotten older, I've kept the level of fitness there so that I can still do that. Whereas I see a lot of my friends from school who they just can't live that way. And that's being, you know, you want, you want to stay healthy for as long as you possibly can. So, um, so I do still do it. I try and do it. Yeah, if you, uh, not, when I get to those really push yourself to your die moments, I just take, I go, that's enough. I've had enough. <laughs> but I certainly like to push myself a little bit still. So, yeah. It looks really nice behind you for anyone watching this on YouTube, but you can see the, the beautiful yeah, it's, yeah, bushes it's like in the a little background. treehouse where we live. It's really, really nice spot. So we're, we're pretty lucky up here. Yeah. So when you say your gym, is your gym on your property? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so we've got our, our main house and then I've kind of, oh, it's only probably 30 meters or so from the house, but um, yeah, I built a custom little shed oh, 10 years ago and I've fitted it all out with all the equipment, but uh, I'm actually in the process of having a discussion with the bank. I'd like to demolish that and build a bigger one. It's getting a bit small now because I'm uh, getting inundated with young athletes and uh, things are starting to really take off um, from the coaching point of view up here. So, um, and getting some, you know, starting to get a few results with athletes and then other athletes are attracted to the environment up here. You know, the climate's really good. The environment for training's really good. We have some pretty good coaches up here and um, you know, now with 2032 Brisbane Olympics being announced, there's, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for coaches and athletes to, you know, see what they're made of. And uh, I'm, I'm already looking at, you know, I've got a bunch of little 11 year olds who I coach who I'm kind of like earmarking for 2032 because that'll be their prime time. So, um, you know, that's, that's, yeah, how you have to look that far long-term in advance. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, with your with how do people? We'll come back to this again at the end. But how do people? Are you taking on more athletes? First of all. Uh, yeah. So I've, the past year's been interesting. I've been building. Oh, sorry, last three years. I've been building up my my squad. Um, a little bit more, certainly more performance focused. And many years ago, I had a chat with one of the big, you know, Nick Badeau, who's Melbourne Track Club. With, um, you know, I've known him for a long time. And he's always said to me, you know, Mark, just forget about the systems. Just you need to set up your own environment and do it that way. So you're not relying on anybody else, um, which was pretty spot on. So, um, because you know, funding comes and goes, and systems come and go, and then different people are in charge of different things. So um, that certainly resonated with me, and I've been doing that ever since. And um, you know, we've got some pretty good results. But I know, as I've accumulated more and more experience and built <clears throat> built a better environment, now we're starting to attract better athletes who are you know moving from interstate to come up and train because you know, we have got a really good environment and we're getting some success. And I think that's going to really snowball over the next few years. So just kind of feel like I'm really just getting started. You, you watch a lot of the best international coaches and they tend to be in their fifties. You know, that 50 to 60 window is where, where they tend to get their really good results. And I kind of feel, I can see that that's you know, happening or about to happen as well. So you wonder why all these years of trials and getting to there and trying to accumulate more experience. And now I'm kind of like, I've got the experience. Now I need the, you know, the, the talented kids to turn up and, and we can make some really good things happen. That's really interesting because you hear people talk a lot about like, you know, peak age as an athlete, but not so much as a coach. And, you know, you're essentially yeah. talking about high performance coaching. Yeah, 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 that's right. And I think, you know, and you know, history shows that that tends to be the window. I think, you know, the, the ones, well, even some of these amazing coaches, they're upwards in their 70s because it's one of those sports that, you know, the more experience and knowledge that you can have, um, the hardest bit's trying to stay in touch with the younger kids coming through because, you know, you start to get a bit older and, you know, even I've noticed it now and you've got some 15-year-olds there and they look at you sideways like, what's this guy talking about? <laughs> so you, just to be able to keep them engaged and that's where having someone like an Alex Beck who I've just coached, you know, with Tokyo in the past couple of weeks he's an older athlete but he's a lot younger than me so when i get the 20 year olds coming in he relates with them really well and he's he and i have become a pretty good team in that sense he's a physiotherapist and um yeah it's another piece of that puzzle that we're building a really good environment um having people like him around as well with a lot of experience and um it's just a good positive environment where we just don't tolerate the the dramas or you know it's a hard sport as it is so we want people who are here for the right reasons and are trying to achieve the same kind of thing so and that's what we're trying to set up so yeah so seeing as you brought it up what was the last few year journey like with alex beck who's just gone to the olympics in tokyo for 400 yeah well, i mean it's funny i was i coached a, a young guy back in 2009 called Oliver Worm. He's down in Melbourne. And he, he won, he was the Australian under 20, 400 metre champion when I coached him back then. And Alex Beck was third on the podium, who I didn't know. He was from Queensland, so I didn't know him from Bar of Soap. And um, it was funny, you know, the years go by. And after 2009, I moved up to the Gold Coast in 2011. Um, and then I started to see, oh, he's this Alex Beck kid. And he won, a, I think a couple of years later, he won an, o an open national title. Um, and then I was working in schools and football clubs and I wasn't doing a lot of coaching. I was doing a few junior things, but nothing too performance-based. Well, like I had done in Melbourne, I'd, I'd done a lot of performance stuff down there. And, um, you know, then you know, I had a couple of kids and, you know, like young family and all that kind of thing. So you get a bit sidetracked with all of that. And then, um, but then three years ago, after the uh, Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, I got a call from Alex just saying, oh, can we catch up for, for coffee? I just want to have a chat, you know, about a few things. And he'd had a few years of just being kind of struggling with everything and not running to what he had done as a, you know, early senior athlete. And... He was just looking for a bit of a change, I think. And we went through all of his programming and just how we, you know, what I thought we could do to make him better. And 
he had never been to the Olympic Games and that was his thing. He'd been to World Championships and Commonwealth Games and everything else as a relay runner. But he'd never run individually at it or competed at an Olympic Games at all. So um, that was, yeah, we had, back then it was two years until Tokyo Olympics. And I said, well, geez, mate, you're getting a little bit old too. That's going to be harder. Um, How old is, was he at the time? He's, he's 26 then. So he's on, you know, not, he's certainly in his prime, but it was like two more years, he'd be 28. He's getting toward the potential tail end of things. Um, but yeah, the first year we, you know, we really talked about a lot of different things and I got to know him better with his training. And then, you know, I, I kind of influenced a little bit about just, you know, the content of his training and how we made it a lot more holistic. And, you know, I, I, I'm a strength and conditioning coach as well. So I'm pretty big on, I do everything. You know, I make sure I'm doing their strength training, their running training and, and in, roll it all in so it's under one banner and I'm not missing anything um, and which he'd never had before and so after the first season he started he ran a PB and he started competing quite well um, and that was that was good we got to know each other quite well by the second season we really knew what we were doing and how we worked together and then obviously we were going really well ready for the Tokyo thing and then obviously COVID hit so we missed he was in great shape. We missed the Olympic trials. Everything came to a standstill. Um, and like so many other athletes, it was like, well, what do we do now kind of thing? Um, and I, I made him take two or three weeks off because he was all motivated in great shape. He's like, no, we're going to train through. I said, mate, this thing is going to be the longest winter of your life. Go and have a break, um, which he reluctantly did. Uh, but in hindsight, I think he was really, he realised how important that was because he'd been going pretty full on with everything. And then we just sat down and I said, well, here's our chance. For this We're lucky here in Queensland because even in lockdowns and everything else, we're still able to get out and train in the great weather and I've got my you know, private facility. So it's open air. So we're allowed to do outside training, you know, so everything was eat relatively easy. Um, so we just pushed through and just... I said, oh, well, here's our chance. We'll push to another level. And, yeah, he had a great season. He was undefeated all year in um, 400 metres and his 200-metre time improved out of sight, which was a big thing for me because I felt he was just a little bit too slow. Um, we probably never really got to squeeze out that 400 to where his training was because we just – I don't know whether it was just – you know, we never really got great weather conditions or the windy days or the competitors – um, with Steve Solomon on the sidelines with a lot of kind of niggly injuries, that certainly didn't help because those two, you know, as you saw with Steve Solomon, you know, he's a, he's a very good athlete and it would have been great to have him through the season compete. Um, and we only got him at nationals when he was, he was, you know, he ran, he ran a fantastic heat. You could see, oh my God, he's about to run really fast again. And I, I don't know whether, it, by the time the final happened, it was freezing cold and he just didn't run to his forms probably and Alex ran really well but the times weren't fast because of the cold conditions but um, so you know I think get then we were just on waiting on you know to get in that top 48 with the ranking lists and the point system and we've been playing that for the last couple of years to just make sure Alex could qualify that was the hardest thing just make that team um, and that went right down to the last couple of days it was really stressful so um we end up chasing races, which I didn't want to be doing. And he was wearing thin and it was, it was, you know, again, it was another one of those roller coaster experiences that you go through and we were lucky we came out on the, on the good side of it. So a lot of athletes didn't, they, they were pushed out on the other side. So it's a, it's a really brutal sport. You know, you can put in years and years of training and still miss out by nothing. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, he deserved it. He, you know, he's very professional with everything he does, Alex. And, um, yeah, I was really happy for him to just get there and then also get to the Olympics, run a PB, run that Queensland record, and then, yeah, to miss the semis by 0.03. It was, I mean, it was harsh, but I think we were both pretty happy given everything that had happened. Um, and, I mean, he's just super motivated now to go to Paris, like, three more years, so... He can see now, and this is why that experience of going to the Olympics, he's found that experience being positive a lot quicker than I did because 
he's there and he's looking at everything and, you know, he's had that good experience of running a PB at the Olympics and realising that these guys running the 44 second runs aren't any better than him. They've just chosen to upgrade themselves to that higher level. And I think, yeah, it'll be interesting to see the next couple of years. I reckon he's going to surprise a few people with how much more we can go, yeah? So. Yeah. That's awesome. So are you able to share some of the strategy behind his race? That he, at the Olympics? Because I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the strategy of stuff. Yeah, so we, you know, that the last month, um, so once we once we got the green light that he was on the team officially selected, and that was only probably four weeks, four or five weeks out from the actual games. And I mean, the two days before he was selected, he was a mess. And physically, he was just worn out. He was tired, like he was done. And... I mean, we, we ran out on the very last day of the qualifying thing. You know, there was one meet on the runaway bay there and we went and ran and it was just, it was wet and cold and miserable. And he was so out of sorts by then and he ran terribly. Now, I didn't even want him to run, but I, he's like, well, I have to try. And I said, yeah, you do. Like, you know, I, I don't want you to run, but you do have to do it. And it was like one of those waste of time kind of couple of days. And then two days later, suddenly things swung around and then there was a couple of athletes dropped out and he fit back into the quota. And then I just said, you know, we went and sat down, had a little meeting and I just said, you're in. I said, okay, you need to get everything positive, sleep well, eat well, get treatment. I don't care if you pay for it every single day. You need to spend the next five weeks being in the absolute best shape of your life and you go to Tokyo and you've got to run a PB at the Olympics. That's all we focus on now. Everything else is irrelevant. So we literally, you know, and I sat down night after night just reconfiguring his training sessions and the content and, you know, what we do. And then when we're at the track, just making sure he's hitting certain markers and cues and just, just trying to put that race strategy, you know, together to get the best out of him. Um, probably a few days before we went to the Cairns, camp um he did a 200 meter session he did he was only supposed to run a couple of pretty fast 200s and he did the first one and it was half a second faster than anything he'd ever done in his life and he pulled up a tiny little bit sore in one of his hamstrings and oh, i just you know so i pulled the session straight away I was, and i was like yelling at him what are you doing mate it was, wasn't supposed to be that fast <laughs> he's like i just feel so good and i was like oh mate so then that kind of cost us, cost us just two key speed endurance sessions. Um, he was fine within a few days to be back to full training. And we also missed one 400 meter race up in Cairns, which in the, ultimately would have only been a time trial against himself. But, you know, they're the little things that now as a coach, I look back, you know, all of his training sessions were PB, 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 every single session we did in the lead up to Tokyo. Um, but we missed those two speed endurance and that one race um, kind of key sessions. And, you know, my gut feeling going in was, oh, geez, is he going to run out the full distance? You know, and he just got pipped on the line by a couple of guys in that last kind of 20 metres. And even though it was a PB and it was all, that was great, that cost us getting to that semi final, which I'm pretty confident if he had have got through to there, the way he's been racing all season, backing up. And, you know, that's been a big thing I've been saying. You need to race a lot more. He'd been very precious with his racing. And I, I think that was a weakness um, because when you get to those championships, you know, you need to be able to run hard and then run faster and just keep going. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident if he had have got to that semi, he would have run a little bit quicker again, which would have been nice. But, I mean, you know, anyway, hindsight's wonderful. We got the PB, we got the record. Um, he's had a great experience um, and he is, he's super motivated now to come and go again. Um, you know, so that's, yeah, they're the fine lines. You're talking hundreds of a second, like those three hundredths of a second because of that one little incident, um, you know, that's what costs you. So it's amazing. It I, I love hearing these stories. Like all we see is that absolute snapshot on TV of, yeah, you know, yeah. what goes into it and, you're talking about years of stuff and coming right down to two single sessions and one race, yeah, you know, yeah, out of yeah. weeks and years. It's yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And, you know, it can all go pear shaped so quickly. I mean, it went pear shaped because he was running so fast and he just overcooked himself because he was feeling so great. And it comes out of nowhere. Like 
we've been, you know, one of the biggest things for me as a coach in the last 10 years is, or probably for longer even, is injury-free athletes. If you're injured, you're useless. You can't compete, you can't train, you can't get the training workloads done. It's just, there's no winning with an injury. So, you know, I've learned that through a lot of my coaches over the years, you know, refining programs and philosophies and just everything is about get the, get the you know, we are, we're working, working that fine line. You can be on this side or this side, um, you know, but if you want performance, you have to push. But if you want in, if you want to be injury free, you can do it safe down here, but then you're not going to perform. So you've got to find that happy medium. And um, I think you know I've certainly become very a lot better at doing that and challenging the limit for the performance and minimising that injury risk. And that's you know because Alex has been very injury free as an athlete um, for the last few years, and that's why he's been so consistent. And I think. You know, that, and that's why he'll be able to push on until his early 30s as well, because he's had a pretty healthy body um, yeah, where we've look, really looked after him. And, and again, and that, you know, the, the flow on for me is I've got these super talented 20, 21-year-olds who are kind of moving and relocating and coming to our squad um, who, you know, watching the next couple of years, you'll see some pretty talented kids coming through. Um, and they just look up to Alex and see what he does and how he goes about it. And it makes my life so much easier as a coach because I'm not having to go over it a hundred times because they just see that. And that's when I've got that good pathway in place now. And, and yeah, let's, let's keep building with that. So we'll come back. At, we'll come back to this at the end, but how do people contact you in order to come and, and join your group or do they need to like go through any processes in order to join? And how do they? How do we even just follow? Oh, for me on Instagram, I just have my Instagram account, which is um, you know Athletic for Life underscore AU, and um, it's most you know. And I po I forget to post half the time because it's this whole social media thing. But um, you know, I try and put some little pictures and snapshots of what we're doing with our training, or you know, some of the results and things like that, and. Um, you know, and I'll get a I'll get a message through there, and it's got on my like a little website and some um, contact phone numbers and things there as well. But most most of the time these days, I'll just get a little direct message from somebody, and they'll say, "Oh, it's interesting to have a chat." So I'll have a phone call, and if they're from anywhere in the region here, I'll, I'll usually sit down and just have a coffee with them, and we have a conversation, um, and I'll find out, you know, if they're serious or not. Like the you want the the athletes who are really, you know want to find out how good they can be. They're the ones that I really want to coach. When, you, know, you, you get a few who are, they, they talk it, but living it's a different thing. It's a pretty hard sport to, you know, really challenge yourself and find out if you really want to do it. And, you know, when athletes come and go, you have athletes who they like the idea of it, they turn up and the reality is a little bit different to what they expected um, because it can be a bit of a grind. But, um, yeah, it's it's you know you I guess the the better system you put in place, then you attract more like-minded people, and that's you know what's starting to happen. So, yeah. so what's the immediate uh, plan post Olympics in the in the weeks after the Olympics? Well, poor old Alex is uh, he's got two weeks in lockdown in Brisbane for a couple of weeks in a hotel, so he's really looking forward to that. <laughs> I think the first couple of days he'll probably just get room service and watch a few movies, but I've, I've already put together a little um, hotel training program for him because I know he'll go crazy. Um, so that'll keep him occupied. And then once he gets back to here, we'll just yeah, ease him back in and, and try and consolidate on his condition. He's in really good shape. And I think that's another thing I've learned over the years. Don't take too long a break. They need a break, but don't take too long a break. I don't mind if they do general training, but um, away from staying in shape because, yeah, you do see a lot of athletes, they'll go on a binging and eating and drinking and go off the rails for a couple of months and then it's a lot of work to get back. And, um, yeah, that's, again, that's part of that process of trying to educate those athletes that just be healthy in your life. Um, and you can still have that mental break. Um, and that's, you know, and that's probably another part of why it's so good up here as a training environment is 
you know, we literally only run on the track twice a week and we have, you know, kind of that international level athletes. I like to keep that variety in there because it can be a bit monotonous, this sport, and I want longevity um, and I want really good performance. So uh, to do that, we, you know, we train track twice a week. We run on the grass, we run in the hills. Um, we do a lot of beach work, um, stair work. Like we have that really good variety. And when you see, you know, where we train, it's pretty, it's a pretty nice environment. You know, they can go and kill themselves on the stairs and the beach and then go and jump in the ocean and, Oh, we're down here at Corumban. It's a pretty iconic kind of little spot there. And, you know, it's beautiful sunny days in the middle of winter. It's not too terrible. So that's my only concern as we go, go further is they all get a little bit soft because they, they're <laughs> so used to the beautiful conditions. Um, and I have to remind them sometimes. So um, we've got a couple, there's a place up in the, up in the mountains just up behind me here where it's, really treacherous hills and rocks and yucky kind of dirt trails. And I make them usually sometime in December or January when we have that quiet competition period, I'll drag the squad up there for a couple of sessions in the heat of the day at midday when it's stifling and the bugs and, you know, I just say, bring a couple of litres of water and your sunscreen and let's go. And they go and run these big mountain hills and they hate it. And, mm -hmm. um, but it reminds them about, you know, a little bit of hardship. So, yeah, got to put them under a little bit of stress. Yeah. So as a strength and conditioning coach yourself, uh, how many strength sessions are they doing in addition to all that that running and the two uh, track sessions? Yeah, it depends who they are. So, I mean, some of the... I mean, Alex probably only lifts twice a week um, and we, we keep that fairly sensible as well. Uh, but we also do a lot of circuit-based training um, to keep him in pretty good condition. We've got um, a fair few things in place, I guess, from a, you know, like hamstring conditioning exercises and some supplementary things that we add on um, to the sessions at different times as well. And, you know, and then it's just working out the dosages and the timing of a lot of those things to make sure that um, we get the best value out of that with, without, you know, overtraining them in some capacities as well. It's easy to load them up with everything because you just chuck it all in because you are oh, it needs to be in the program but sometimes you're just doing it for the sake of it and you know and you do you learn off those really good international coaches and they're like they're very big on you know justifying well why do you have certain things in the program and if you don't need it get rid of it like there's a, there's things in there that people just do for the sake of it so um i think you know again and that's working with alex closely Having, he's a pretty smart, intelligent athlete. So that has been really good from our point of view is we work together and we try things. And I, usually I'll try things first and I'll experiment with some different training things and stuff that we see or I talk about and I'll muck around with it. And if I think it's got an application that's practical, I'll get Alex to have a little bit of a try with some stuff um, and give it enough time to see if it um, is valuable. And then, um, yeah, we go, go through that way. So I'm kind of the guinea pig and, um, you know, but usually we, we won't do things unless we think it's, it's, very, it's going to be helpful. So, yeah. What do you think of that? I like that idea. How, what do you think of the idea of I wouldn't get my athletes to do anything that I wouldn't do myself? And, he, and even you now in your 50s, yeah. you know, you're still, yeah. you know, using yourself as a guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, I mean I'm in that. I guess I'm, you know, I'm lucky in the sense that I've looked after myself reasonably well so that I can still, you know, I still get in there in the gym with boys and, um, you know, I just make sure I can compete with the, well, the young ones, no problem, but the Alexes and those guys and um, even out when we're doing medicine ball throws and all that kind of stuff, I like to just kind of jump in and do a little bit with them just to remind them that they're still not where they need to be. <laughs> so it's a bit of fun as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, definitely like to experiment with different things and, and try out exercises and see if there's, yeah, some positive application for us, for sure. Yeah. I apologise. I shouldn't have said now that you're in your 50s. I said, oh, nearly there. Yeah, close. Oh, mate, this I'm, is a I podcast. Like so it sits there for years. So it, <laughs> it, it, as like you I go am. into your 50s, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how, what is that mentally for you like at the moment at 49? How, how are you oh, coping with 2050? Don't, I couldn't care less. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I just... Uh, it's just you know they you know you hear it all the time. Oh, age is just a number, and it's true. To me, it's more 
I get annoyed if I get a little niggle or something happens um, and I get frustrated because I can't train how I'd like to train. But usually those things come about through a sheer stupidity um, on my own behalf because, you know, I may not have warmed up thoroughly or I've rushed something or, um, you know, I will have been chasing kids around all day or coaching for a big 12-hour day or doing something and then you expect that you're going to be able to go and, you know, do a training session at a high standard. It's like, you know, you've got to remind yourself, uh, you know, you are human and things will go go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> are you so, coaching full-time now or do you have, is this on the side too? Uh, well, no, coaching the performance stuff is definitely a hobby. <laughs> um, it's growing, certainly. And I have my junior squads, which help, you know, pay a little bit. I work full-time at Somerset College as, you know, at, at head coach athletics and cross country there. And I do a lot of kind of extra stuff for the school. Um, but things are all getting to a head now. And I do a lot of private um I guess, strength and conditioning and speed development stuff for rugby and AFL players as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm just, I'm definitely overloaded at the moment. So I've been kind of pushing through to Tokyo um, and also the end of the school athletics carnival season, which everything just keeps getting bumped. Like we've had this lockdown the last couple of weeks. We've missed our school, you know, regional carnival, which hopefully gets to go in a couple of weeks. And um, we've had our... Earlier in the year, we got our track at the school, which is fantastic, but it was ripped up in January, smack in the middle of our competitive season. I mean, that was mind boggling from my point of view because it was that's when it rains here. They couldn't have done much anyway. And we certainly, it didn't help us in our um, training with uh, Alex and the performance guys. So I had another young guy who went, he made the world junior team um, as well. So it was, it was, yeah, it was a hindrance, but we worked around it. So, we, you know, as things come up, you just work on, oh, how do we how do we work this out? So, and we're lucky up here, there's a couple of other tracks which we were able to, you know, relocate to, but it was a, it was a headache for me because I had the, you know, the, I'm based at the school, my office is at the track, and then suddenly we have no track. Um, so that's, yeah, they could have waited a couple of months, would have been good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Who is but, that? You know, Sorry, yeah. uh, his name is Tyson like Bonney. He, he, he was in the, uh, so he's a 200 metre athlete. Um, I think he, he ended up qualifying for the four by one and the four by four relay because he's, he's one of those kind of weird characters. He's, a, he's okay at the 100 metres. He's really good at the 200 metres. Um, and because of his 200 metre speed, he can throw out the occasional really good 400 as well. So he qualified, he ran a world junior qualifier in the 400 not training for the 400 or based off his 200 meters. Um, he only missed the qualifying in the 200 by hundredths of a second. And we just, at the back end of the season, we just kept copying headwinds and whatever. But um, I, as I've said to him from the start, I've coached him for the last three years. He's, you know, he's a late developer. He's improving every year and I've got him on a trajectory for, okay, well, three years from now, you'll be 22 years old for Paris. And that's where we're looking at for him with 200. So, yeah. And are you looking at um, 2022 with the, I think it's London Commonwealth Games as well? Uh, so, yeah, next year we have, yeah, Manchester Commonwealth Games. Um, but we also have Oregon for the World Championships. Yeah, so they're all being squashed together in the one year. And then we also, there's a World University Games on next year, which is supposed to be in China. I mean, I don't know if any of these things will go ahead, but... Um, Fingers crossed they do. Um, so there's there's a ton of... And there's a World Juniors on again next year as well. So there's four really big international competitions on next year. Um, you know, I'd like to think I'll have four or five athletes going to a, a bunch of those um, with the people that are, yeah, moving up. So um, it's, yeah, it's exciting. So, and then, yeah, then obviously suddenly it'll be... 2024 before we know it yeah and do you get to travel and go to these events as well uh his, history says no i've coached athletes to nearly every olympic since 2000 and um no i've never we've never really had any opportunities to do anything <laughs> we do all the coaching and the um and the development and uh yeah we get to sit on the sidelines but i know you know that's 
you know, again, speaking from, you know, Nick Badeau, get plenty of athletes on the team and they have to take you. So you, you can, things change pretty rapidly. If you've got, you know, if I've got half a dozen athletes on a team, then that's going to change things pretty rapidly. Is it two, two at Tokyo? Uh, so I only had one in Tokyo. One. Yeah, so just Alex. But, um, yeah, next year, yeah, I'm looking, I've got a couple of girls who are ready to go, I think. So we should have, yeah, I won't even, we'll see how we go. I'll wait till we get the, them actually qualified, but we could easily have two or three. So, which would be a good start and then we can yeah, build from there. So. Oh, it sounds awesome. It sounds very exciting. How, how yeah. do you, you mentioned um, injury proofing the athletes and, you know, particularly with Alex, um, hasn't had too many injuries. How do you go about that, particularly with your younger athletes? Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of that is, it's the programming and making sure that we train smart for a start. Um, I mean, sometimes, you know, I make decisions on things where, like, you know, I watch and I talk with my athletes on a daily basis. Um, and the higher the standard, well, I see them, you know, I'm seeing them six or seven days a week. So making sure that I've got that really good communication pathway with them. I watch them all in their warm-ups and their training. And I, I mean, I think it's just purely now experience. Like you watch things happening and you can see before it's happening, you know, I'll be like, stop, come here. What, why, what's going on? Something's not right. What is it? And then they'll be like, oh yeah, I didn't get any sleep last night. And I'm a little bit tight here and da da da. And then straight away, I can just manipulate the session to suit. Um, and that's one thing I'm big on with any of the new athletes who, who come and join us is be fully transparent. If you go out and you have a big night out and you do something stupid or whatever, I, I need to know because we can prevent problems before they arise. If you're trying to hide things from me, I'm not, not going to be able to give you the best support. So that's been really good. Um, but, you know, and then the programming and making sure that the content's good and we are ticking off a lot of the, you know, the right things that we need in there. And I'm probably the biggest thing I'm big on is just really good running technique. If they have really good running technique, then that prevents a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So the juniors that I've had since they're a young age, they're quite easy because if I've coached them for three or four years, then I know that they've built up a pretty good running technique. Um, and then it's just making sure the programming's, you know, really good from a conditioning point of view. So that's kind of easy if I have them when they're younger. Um, but when you inherit an athlete who's older and has, you know, I've, got, I've got a girl this year who's 19 years of age and she's had chronic problems for the last three years and it's, they're really difficult to work with. She's been basically injured and sore for three years and um, trying to get her positive mindset up, eliminate those injury issues, um, and then get her back on track and conditioned to the new style of training, that takes a lot of effort um, and a lot of patience and from, from the athlete more so than me because I know where it's going and how long this is going to take and I can keep reinforcing that to them. But, you know, day by day, they, they want to get, a, you know, they want some results. So 19-year-olds um, generally aren't very patient. <laughs> So, but, um, you know, they're the ones, the tricky ones, when you inherit a kind of towards senior athlete um, and they've got, you know, injury history and concerns, that takes a lot of, a lot of energy. Mm. So, What's yeah. the youngest athletes that you take and that you've got? Oh, I mean, I coach little kids, you know, from five or six or seven, you know, who I'll do some fun stuff with and then right through to the Alexes who are, you know, pushing 30. Um, but I mind you, I've coached masters athletes as well who are nearly 70 or 80 years of age too. So I've worked with the full range. Um, and I think the biggest thing to acknowledge through all of that is that they're all different individuals and you've got to assess them all on, uh, on that case by case kind of basis. So little kids, you know, they, they're more just fun and having games. Once they can't kind of start getting to 11, 12, 13 years of age, then they can start to do um, that's when, you know, they're growing really rapidly and they're getting stronger and it's really critical that we've laid that foundation of their technical movements. And if we can put that in there and then the pathway's pretty clear. So, um, and it saves me a lot of grief later on. So I, that's, you know, everyone says, why do you coach all these young kids? And I was like, well, I'm trying to save myself a headache down the track. So I'm trying to build these kids so that 
they are prepared for when, you know, I, I literally, for me, it's secondary school, you finish year 12, that's when athletics gets serious. So yeah. by the time they, you know, they still enjoy it and they're still interested and they're going to university and, you know, working a little bit or whatever, that's when things need to step up. So if I can kind of prepare them for that along the way, whereas a sport like swimming, you know, they can be winning medals in their teenage years. So it's a totally different concept. Like ours is a long-term development sport. And you have to just be patient and keep them engaged and interested. And it's, you know, it's hard because it's like at the end of the day, they're running in this, you know, running around circles and um, how do you keep them, you know, interested in it? So I, at, at the school level, I coach everything to be like multi-event faceted, which helps me try and win premierships for the school in the into school stuff. Um, but it also creates a really big base of multi-event athletes who, as they get toward the end of year 12, they're, you know, they're quite confident in a lot of different things and then um, they can gravitate toward the events that they're more suited to physiologically. So, yeah, it's an interesting Very, kind of model, but it works really well. Yeah. Oh, it's, it sounds like music to my ears, actually. I really like it. And I know there's a lot of people listening. I know there's people who listen to this that would absolutely love hearing what you're saying about yeah, the whole long-term athlete development. Yeah, it's got to be done patiently. Yeah. Yeah. All right, it's time for 10 and 10. Okay. Now, I worded you up about this before we started recording. So I've been taking notes as you have been talking. You got 10 seconds per question. We don't just make that. Yeah. Okay. The first thing that comes to mind, it can be a one word answer. It can be a full sentence, whatever it is that comes to mind first. All right, we're ready? Let's go. Okay, number one, athletics. Uh, best sport in the world. Number two, your favorite event. One. 200, 400, 800. Am I allowed to say three? I love it. Uh, yeah, you of can them. do that. Yeah, you made the rules. Yeah, those, up. <laughs> those three, I find they're just super challenging events to coach and train for. So they're, yeah, all of them are great. Two, two little add, I always add in little things here as, you, as people answer. But 2B here, what is your PB for 2, 4, and 800? Oh, okay. 200, uh, 21, 0, 0, but I ran a 20.66 windy at the Nationals one year in seniors. I got a snuck a third. So I kind of know the potential there was probably not tapped into, knowing what I know now. Uh, 400, I ran 45.70. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. You know, you know your potential could have been a little bit better. And the 800... Oh, I literally never ran 800s in my life. I did a couple of them in training um, with some of the middle distance boys back in the day. And I, I know I ran a, like a 149, eight or something in training. So that's an event that I'm very glad I hadn't, um, I didn't push too much. I hated aerobic training. So hindsight says I probably should have done a bit more of it. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Number three, what does the Olympics mean to you? Um, I just think it's the, I mean, it's the biggest international event for sport um, in the world. I know there's World Cup soccer, but the Olympics embraces every type of person in the world. There's an opportunity for somebody to be good at something. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good thing. They just need to get back on track with it. It's about the athletes and not about the money. Yeah. <laughs> Number yeah. four, coaching. Um, a lifestyle it's number five uh, it's helping just helping people that's why i coach yeah number five high performance environments Ooh. really difficult to create and difficult to get support for um i'm hoping in the next few years we get a little bit more support for those high performance programs we have so much talent in australia it's really frustrating not to have it support that is yeah yeah number six what is enough uh individual personal bests i think i think everybody just reaching an individual's potential whatever that may be i don't care what level it is they just need to reach their potential yeah number seven the impact of covid horrendous <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that's, the, the positives have been that people have realised that you can really work hard in, you know, away from competition. 
but it's been more detrimental than it's been positive from my point of view, I think. Number eight, injury proofing. Sensible training. Number nine, the 2032 Olympics. Uh, yeah, really exciting. And uh, it, as always, it's potential. It's potential for also for our government and national sporting bodies to finally make some good decisions about the direction of it, though. They just stop being so bureaucratic administration driven and be athlete and coach focused. It's as simple as that. Number 10 is one that I ask every guest and it's a little bit left field, but if you could time travel and you could go forward in time or back in time and still come back to now, if you chose to, at what time would you go to and why? Oh, here we go. This is, this could be really selfish. <laughs> selfish. <laughs> That's a uh, I mean, I've thought about this a lot. I, I think, uh, I mean, you know, on a global scale, you do something much better than this, but from a purely self-interested uh, position, I'd probably go back to when I was about 15 or 16 years of age and just lay it all out, lay it down for myself to just say, do this, and then that will put you on a much better pathway with some, you know, athletic performances. That would be fun, yeah. That's I don't awesome. know if I'd listen. I don't know if the 16-year-old me would listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark Ladbrook, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Mind Your Body Show. I have learned so much and I'm sure um, everyone listening has as well. Uh, if people would like to connect with you, they can find you on Instagram at athleticforlife underscore AU with the number four, athletic number four life underscore AU. Uh, is that the best way? Is there other ways to contact yeah, you as nah, well? Yeah, that's, that's a really easy way. It's got all the contact details there. So just um, yeah, send me a message, Rick, give me a phone call, no problem. Yeah, Happy cool. And we'll link. We'll link all that up in the show notes. Um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge you for all the work that you do in athletics with all of your athletes and um, congratulate you for the successes that you've had. And thank thanks, you Jake. very much for being a guest on the Mind Your Body Show. No, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, great to meet you, Jacob. Yeah, looking forward. When I'm in Darwin, I'll uh, look you up. We'll go and have a coffee, mate. It'd be great. Awesome.